Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. This is your boy Mongo Slade. So today we want to talk about Shawn Michaels' coked field <laughs> ventures through WWE. I cannot believe what took place on this biography. Oh my God! There are so many great quotes floating through this joint. Uh, you got Shawn Michaels saying <laughs> the yayo. He said it two or three times. He was talking about getting paid in blow. I mean, it was tremendous. This was probably the best biography yet. Tremendous. And it was not, oh, they took a, it took a dark turn. It was like, dude, it was dark for an hour. You know, like Sean just kept talking about being a drug addict and how he wasn't in the right frame of mind. And then he didn't go into any real detail about um, some of the more, some of the crazier thing. They touched on just about everything, though. Him uh, not getting the tag team titles due to the Rockers, his fight with Marty Jannetty backstage, uh, his bad reputation that him and Marty got for getting into it with Jesse Barr, a.k.a. Jimmy Jack Funk, uh, the Montreal Screwjob, obviously, the curtain call, obviously. Um, they did a lot more traveling with, uh, with Sean than I thought. They talked about him being a Continental. They talked about him being an AWA. They didn't talk in any detail about, you know, what he did or why he left or of uh, 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 those places or Mid-South and stuff like that. And I haven't finished his book. I actually, he's got three, I think. Um, I've read part of Heartbreak and Triumph, which is what the documentary that WWE did for the DVD is based on Heartbreak and Triumph. It's the same title. Um, but I've read, you know, a good chunk of that. Haven't finished it, though. Um, so I can't give you a blow by blow, but I can talk about <laughs> certain things. So let's talk about this biography, dog, because this biography is wild. This joint was wild. So <laughs> one thing I want to add some color to some things, obviously, um, he started talking about basically he started doing blow in 1986 because that's where he met Marty Jannetty and him and Marty was wilding out <laughs> now in the, in the book uh heartbreak and triumph he talk basically talks about hanging out with scott hall when he first met scott hall was in awa and kurt henning and basically they was the they were the click of awa and that when he first went to awa he was pretty naive he trusted promoters he didn't do drugs he didn't drink he didn't do any of that stuff and then he went to awa and basically, they kind of forced it on him. You know, they, they wanted him to be more personable, wanted him to be open, to be fun, to be one of the boys. And in doing so, they were taking him to bars. And Jannetty even said it in the biography, he wasn't old enough to go into these bars. He was only 19. Um, so he wasn't old enough to be in, in any of these places. And he had only been in the business for about two years. He had spent most of that time in mid south working for bill watts and then he had got sent up to kansas city to work for bob geigel so he was he was in those areas and then he found his way up to awa awa had espn so they was making a little bit more money um and those guys were big big partiers they were also big ribbers they got into a lot of trouble you know they started they, <laughs> They even talked about stealing Nick Bockwinkle's AWA title and they hid it and he never found it. But basically, this is that's where the idea, that's where the Rockers were born. For all of you young folks who probably didn't even watch this, the uh, the Rockers were born in AWA. They were originally called the Midnight Rockers. They were named after a Judas Priest song, Living After Midnight. Um, and it basically was them saying, we partied all the time anyway, and the party doesn't start till midnight. So we we live in after midnight, and basically they were a bootleg rock and roll express. Back then, either every tag team was either trying to be a knockoff of the Rock and Roll Express, or they were trying to be a knockoff of the Road Warriors. They chose the Rock and Roll Express, you know. <laughs> so, but um, Sean knew the Rock and Roll Express from the um, from Mid South. He used to ride with them. Um, so, well, he used to drive them because you don't quote unquote ride with veterans; you drive them. So. Um, that was that was that thing. But <clears throat> basically, this is where he started getting his problems because he started getting into it with Vern Gagne all the time. 
And basically, all the stuff that you've heard about him saying about how he would go after Vince, he went after Vern too. Except Vern was a meaner, more uh, stubborn <laughs> guy. And Vern didn't like to pay people. It's notorious that Vern didn't like to pay. So, um, and he he was very old school. So if you didn't have a, a a solid wrestling background, he would basically see you're not really good enough to be a champion. But he basically talked about, you know, in that book that he became very anti-office, that he always started to see that the office were, you know, sort of the bad guys. And since he was coming in during the, the, the end of the AWA period, their, their, their height days were over. Vince had taken Hulk Hogan and took in, uh, I think, uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan was also gone around this time. Jesse Ventura, a bunch of other people from Minneapolis. He just took them. So, so Vern didn't have anybody. And, uh, <laughs> so, and Vern didn't help himself, you know, but Vern was, was being a douche and he didn't want to pay people. And so one of Vern's big markets is Chicago. It's a huge city in the United States. And there's a great story in there about, I think it was Playboy Buddy Rose who asked Shawn Michaels, if I told you there was a hundred dollars in a tree in Chicago, would you go and get it? And Sean said, absolutely not. I would not drive from Minneapolis to Chicago to get a hundred dollars. And he says, well, that's what you will be doing if you went to work with Vern in Chicago and I'm not going. And then from there, a bunch of other people decided he wasn't going either. <laughs> that, was, like, that was insane to me. They basically just said, fuck work. <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> they were like complete douchebags. And, and this is before Sean was a huge star. So he was a douchebag as a, basically as a youth. Him and Mar him and Marty getting in trouble. They talked about in the biography, you know, him going to the WWF. Um, him and Marty, the first time he left the AWA, and they went up there, and the boys hated him because they had a bad reputation. Um, as, you know, being big partiers, big ladies men, and stuff like that. This is where they get into get into it. Day one with Jesse Barr. Um, they were told to go and mingle, go shake hands, go be friends, go be friendly, go show your face. Uh, but Sean was, you know, saying like, despite the fact that, you know, his character was all about being a sexy boy and everything, he was always nervous around other people. So he was never, you know, he kind of used Marty as a crutch. Like Marty was the outgoing guy. You know, Marty would go out and make friends and Marty would go out and get the girls. So he was kind of waiting for Marty to be the guy to go out and shake hands and do all that type of stuff. And since Marty didn't do it, he didn't do it. And so when they didn't go to the WWF and didn't make friends and shake hands and kiss ass and all that stuff, basically they, they, the, the, the locker room turned on them. And that's when, you know, Jimmy Jack Funk, AKA Jesse Barr decided to go in there and, uh, and mess with them. Sean got mad because he said he has a temper. He smashed a bottle over his head and, you know, was like, what are you going to do, man? I'm crazy. Yada, yada, yada. And it went from, him confronting Jesse Barr over this minor situation that Jesse Barr started. And it turned into this old wives tale about how they tore up the bar and he did all this crazy stuff. Now they got kicked out of AWA. Well, they didn't get kicked out. They got the AWA kicked out of the showboat in Las Vegas because they tore up a hotel room because they were living like rock stars. So they decided we we're going to be rock stars and rock stars tear up hotel rooms. So that's what they did. So that's where they had their reputation from is that they uh, really screwed over the AWA. And um, so when they went to the WWF, that reputation followed them. And then got the boys just basically goaded them into doing something stupid. And, the, <clears throat> and then from there, a bunch of other guys who were, who were present decided not to stand up for them. They just kind of stepped out and was like, nope, whatever Jesse Barr says happened, that's what happened. And um, they ended up getting fired. And then he started talking about how, you know, oh, yeah, he went to uh, Alabama. They went to work for Continental. And this is where he said that he <laughs> he got paid $100. And he, if you got paid $50 in cash and $50 in blow. <laughs> <laughs> I am all about the Sean and Marty cocaine party. You feel me? I am 100% in camp of that being a movie like these two young i mean i think marty's what four or five years older than sean i think but i'm, I'm all about these two young guys
just going nuts in the wrestling business, being hyped up on cocaine and just acting an ass everywhere that they go. Now, the whole thing with Jesse Barr was also not just about them acting stupid in the AWA. It was also pretty kind of personal. And this happens a lot in the wrestling business where it was a, it was a, a rat or whatever that Jesse Barr wanted to bang and Marty ended up fucking the girl. And that wasn't, that didn't sit well with him. So he decided to get these guys fired, but it was a bunch of other people who didn't like him either. Like people who wanted their spot, people who just didn't like him and don't want the competition in the locker room, get them out of here. So Vince fired them. Um, they ended up working their way back and they ended up coming back in 1988. And, uh, they were on their good. They were on their best behavior around this time. So Pat Patterson went to bat for them in uh, WWF the second time. Basically, they were on a probationary period. This time, the Dynamite Kid, Tommy Billington, who was one of the most miserable bastards to ever walk the earth. The more wrestling books I read, the more I've come to not like the Dynamite Kid, and I didn't like him that much from the beginning like i always thought he's a phenomenal performer but if you read like about the dynamite kid he's a horrible human being like some of the stuff we give people grief over billington was doing like all kind of horrible shit to people he was throwing syringes at people like darts like, the dude's a fucking psycho okay anyway um the dynamite kid told him to go in there shake everybody's hand make friends so they did and everybody over time they became to be accepted by everybody in the locker room except Andre the Giant. Andre will always act like they didn't exist. So they would try to shake his hand, you know, talk to him like everybody else would talk to him. And he would basically continue playing whatever he was playing, cribbage or whatever, um, spades or whatever card game he liked to play. And then he said they finally got his respect in Europe when uh, they had a six-man tag where they were on teams with Andre. They worked the match or whatever. And after the match, he was willing to shake their hands. And then they were like, wow, you know, this is awesome. You're like, you know, Andre the Giant shook my hand. And he says, I thought you didn't like us. And then he says, Andre told him, like, at first I didn't like you. But then I started to like you. I just didn't shake your hand anyway. And they were like, what? What's going on? Like, why? He's like, it was a rip. <laughs> he, he made them wait a full year for a handshake over a rip. It was crazy. But that's about as far as into the book I got. It's like the 1990s when they were wrestling the Rougeau's. But the um, but the biography, it went into more about why the Rockers broke up. Now, this was actually very interesting because I didn't know that much about this. Apparently, a um, out of his mind, Roddy Piper decided to kind of goad the Rockers. But basically, Big and Shawn Michaels' ego up, telling him that he was going to be really good and that Marty wasn't really all that good. And when Marty was kind of trying to be like, "What do you What do you mean? Like, what are you trying to do here?" Um, Shawn took it as he was you know, being offensive to him. And then Sean and Marty ended up fighting. And this actually what led to them breaking up. In the book, it was a little bit different than the way they told it in the biography. And the way in the biography, it was Marty Jannetty saying Sean started to fight. In the book, it was Sean saying Marty started to fight. But they both seemed to agree that the fight started because of Roddy Piper and drugs. They were all doing drugs with Roddy Piper. And apparently Sean had been, you know, trying to, he was he was one to pick brains like he would always you know, ask guys for advice and stuff like that. And Piper is one of the guys he always went to. And um, Piper was talking about how he's going to be a success and all that kind of shit. And Marty either A, got offended or B, Sean got a super ego. And then next thing you know, they were fighting and the, the Rockers wasn't lasting too much longer after that. Now, um, it was also said that, you know, Sean always wanted to go solo. He didn't really want to be in a tag team anyway. Um, this was also addressed that, you know, but I hate that they skipped over the feud, the Sean and Marty feud. They skipped over it in the, in the biography. I think that's very important, especially for establishing the heartbreak kid. Um, you have to establish whose hearts he was breaking. It wasn't just young ladies and there's different kinds of heartbreak. When I do my archetypal story on you know, Sean Michaels, we'll get into that. But, um, I hate that they skipped over the Marty Jannetty feud, um, but there was so much stuff in this documentary to go over. I get why they had to make certain concessions. Now I did like that. He said that, you know, the heartbreak kid was basically a mixture of Elvis who he really, really liked. They didn't talk about it in biography a lot, but it's in the book that he really kind of was a big fan 
of Elvis. And he became a fan of Elvis from God, who who was it? Um it was somebody, I believe, in I think it was uh Brian Nobbs of the Nasty Boys, who was the one who taught him to love Elvis. But he basically says that the Heartbreak Kid was a mixture of Elvis and Freddie Mercury. At least that's kind of how he envisioned it. But I wouldn't say Elvis when you got the Honky Tonk Man on the roster. I think the Honky Tonk Man was still there too, wasn't he? Um, I also don't like that they skipped over Sherry. I think Sherry is such an important part of Sean's career, and she never gets the appropriate credit. It's almost that's so sad um, that they don't talk enough about Sherry and what she added to the various guys that she was with. But she added a lot to Sean. She was very important in getting over. Shawn Michaels and his character. Shawn, I mean, Sherry is indispensable in getting over Shawn Michaels and his character. I can't believe that they, well, I can believe it because they always do it. They just stop doing it. Of course, they talked about the drug field fight that he had in Syracuse. They got his eye fucked up, even though they didn't say, you know, he got the winder and eye from that, but I believe that is where he came from. Um, but basically, just talked about his, you know, his raging addiction to cocaine and painkillers. And everybody who's listening to this probably already knows the Shawn Michaels story. I don't need to go beat by beat. But it was tremendous. Like, one of the best quotes I probably ever heard in my life is when he was talking about Bret Hart. And he says that, you know, if something bothered Bret Hart, I made sure I did it. <laughs> I never I never in my life heard somebody with such visceral hate for another human being. Him and Brett. Oh god, man. That's tremendous stuff. That's tremendous stuff, dog. That was that's such a great quote. And I'm glad Brett was in it, you know, to talk about the screw job and him knocking out Vince and they played a nice little clip of Brett asking Sean if he knew about the thing, and Sean's like, I swear to God, man, I had no idea, hand to Jesus, or whatever, clearly lying, um, but of course, he says, like, you know, drug addicts lie all the time, <laughs> he was so open about the drug use in this thing, it was great, this was a fantastic biography, you know, this was, it was fun, it was funny, they mixed in the old with the new because they also mixed in some stuff that, you know, showing that he was doing things with NXT. I think they probably showed a little too much. They showed like a, a rehearsal for a ladder match in NXT. I forget which show that was. But um, I was like, why are we showing the rehearsals? Like, that's a little much. Like, oh, him talking to talent and in the ring and coaching and stuff like that. Okay, him sitting at the little at gorilla or whatever. Okay, cool. But we got him walking through ladder matches with the Ute. And I'm like, I don't know about that one, dog. That's a little too much. I don't know. Maybe I'm too protective of the whole, you know, business. I mean, we, we need to get over it. And we need to just start putting cameras everywhere, all of us, you know, all, all the time now, I guess. Another sad quote that I heard, and this was pretty funny too, but it was funny for a different reason, is Sean often talked about how, you know, he would get so down he wished he was dead. One of the crazy things that Triple H said he heard Sean say is that he wished he had done enough drugs to die after WrestleMania 10 because then he would be the biggest star in the business and he would be like Elvis. He would, I was like, what? Now, Sean has, was down, was down bad for, you know, a couple of times. I know they said he was pretty much suicidal when he got lost his first WWF contract in Continental, he was down there making a lot less money, and uh, he was struggling. He was not a fan of himself then. He also wasn't a fan of himself when he ended up blowing up on Triple H that time at, uh, what was that, 2001, the simulcast with uh, WCW. He was there acting stupid, peeled out of his gourd. He ended up, um, he was, Vince ended up sending him home. He blamed Triple H for it, went and cussed Triple H out, and Triple H cussed him out, and they didn't speak for a year or two. So, but they went over, you know, they kind of lightly touched everything. They didn't, like, drill in on anything in particular. They also didn't talk about, you know, there's so many things that they could have talked about, but they didn't, you know. But, of course, that's, like, the Shawn Michaels mythos is that he was an absolute, you know, raging cock. And they didn't hide from it. 
but there was, it's only two hours. You know, you have to talk about some of the good stuff too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, they could, they could talk about some of the good stuff too. Um, they, they didn't mention his first wife, which, uh, seems to make sense, I guess. So, um, but you know, these things are, this was a good biography. It was funny. It was interesting. You know, Sean was pretty open. There were still obviously some things that were, that were left out, but you know, I can't outside of Sherry and the feud with Marty and I, I can't really think of how many other things I would have I would have thrown in there. You know, like I probably would have left out some of the NXT stuff or at least put it near the end. And uh made gave that extra time to talk about his feud with Marty and how important that was for the character, for the man himself, for them. You know, as as two guys who have been traveling on the road together for years at that point, took a couple of minutes, at least two minutes to talk about Sherry, because, again, she's indispensable in talking about Shawn Michaels, I, especially in the early days. I just it's ridiculous that, you know, she doesn't get the credit she deserves on that tip. There's so much to the Shawn Michaels mythos that you can't cram it all in two hours in a concise narrative. You just can't do it. But it was still pretty good, and it was one of the better biographies. I think I still think Roddy Piper's was probably the best so far. Um, Steve Austin's was pretty good too, but I think Sean's is up there as well. But let me know what you guys think if you watched it. Um, like this, share this video, subscribe to the channel, give me a couple of bucks on Subscribe Star or Cash App if you please. And I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out.